Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we thank you for blessing us and saving us and loving us. And Lord, thank you for giving us this opportunity to offer the praise of our lips to you and for the joy that uh, we have received. And Lord, we ask that you open the eyes and ears and hearts of our understanding that we may receive more of you this day. That would be a joy that's uh, never to be taken back, an eternal joy. More God, more God, more God in each life. That's the most important thing when you pray. You pray for other people and you pray for yourself. Pray for more of God. That's the number one thing to pray for. After that, you can pray for things and whatever. But pray for God. More of God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay. Today we're going to talk about the wedding. There's a wedding waiting for us. Soon to be here. And the title is, Come, the Wedding is Ready, Are You? And it's all about our readiness. Let's start off with that. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to cover Matthew 22, verses 1 through 13. But it's all broken up. So I'm going to read the whole thing to you first. It's right here, right out of the Bible. And then we'll, we'll be able to maybe comprehend the wholeness of it as we go. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. And they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants, and entreated them spitefully, and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies, and destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready. But they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So the servants went out into the highways, and gathered together all, as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how comest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness, there should be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So that's our primary text, okay? So we're going to start off with a little little background here. I'm just going to give this to you and go on. Next down is Matthew 25, verses uh, 1, 2, and 3. No, actually, it would be 1 through 5 is what it is. And I'll read this to you. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil. Now, oil in the Bible is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So, they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil, symbol of the Holy Spirit, with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. I want to give you those verses. I'm not going to comment on them now. We're going to comment on the the text that we're going to use, Matthew, but those verses are going to come into play pretty soon. So let's start off now in Matthew chapter 22. We'll do over again now, verses 1 through 3. And what God is talking about here is the Old Testament. Okay? And Jesus answered and spake unto them, and that's the multitude of people that were around him, and spake unto them again by parables. And a parable is a comparison. It's, a, it's stories used to illustrate and explain what you're saying, all right? Uh, let me just drop down while we're doing this about the parables, or the first footnote here, Matthew 13, 34. 
All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them. We are the multitude. Everybody's a multitude, saved and unsaved alike. And again, by parables, excuse me, and without a parable spake he not unto them. He didn't speak unto the people without a parable. Now that's something to remember. See, because a parable is not the message. The message is hidden within the parable. But he only spoke to the people in parables. Let's go to the second footnote here. Mark chapter 4, verse 34, uh, 4 through 34. No, I'm sorry. Mark chapter 4, verse 34. Without, but without a parable speaking out unto them, that's the multitude again, and when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. And when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. Expounded means in the Greek to solve further, to explain. Now, comparatively speaking, we are alone today. You, you may not all be saved and born again here, but most are, okay? That means that you're a disciple. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to expound the parable. You see? And there's no sense in it, if, if this was a, a crowd outside this, this church here and we were standing in the corner someplace, there would be no reason at all to expound the parable because most of the people wouldn't have any idea what you're talking about. How come? Because the parable is the Word of God. It's a tongue. The tongue of God? The tongue? Okay, the whole Bible is the tongue of God. But in order to understand it, you have to have what? Who said that? Holy Spirit. You have to have the Holy Spirit inside you to understand, understand the Word of God. This whole Bible here, you can read it and write books about it. And people have, Isaac Asimov and, and, uh, and lots of famous people have written books about it who were not saved. They didn't get it. They wrote books about it, but they didn't get it. They got the storyline, but they didn't get what God was trying to tell them. Because they couldn't, because they did not have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside them to explain to them the Word of God, to interpret the Word of God. God spoke it, the Holy Spirit interprets it. Tongues. Okay? Now let me go back up here and, and start. And Jesus answered and spake unto them, again by parables, and said, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, and in this case it's Father God who is the king, okay, so we have to remember that, which made a marriage for his son, and his son is Jesus Christ, okay? And he sent forth his servants, and his servants in the Old Testament were the prophets, to call them that were bidden, in the Greek that means called, bidden means called, to call them that were bidden to come to, to the wedding. And they would not come. Well, so going down, dropping down to Matthew 22, verses 4 through 7. Again, he sent forth other servants. So then what the Lord did is he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, which are called. Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed. And the fatling in the Greek means it's, something, it's an animal that's been grained. When you, when you feed an animal grain, you feed them very, very healthy, fattening food as compared to um, uh, just the grass, okay? All right? So it's, it's called a fatling, and then when you do that, you do it on purpose. Fat was a very precious substance in the Old Testament. People, that was a, uh, it's not like that today, I don't, although some of, some of us probably like fat, but uh, I kind of stay away from it. But it was a very precious kind of substance. So you would, you would fatten up your animals. And of course, most farmers try to do that as well when they're trying to sell their, sell their cattle. And he sent, sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. What is the marriage? The marriage is when we consummate our union with Jesus Christ. Right now, each of us, we're all engaged to Jesus Christ, okay? But when we have the marriage, we are the bride. We're, we come together and consummate that marriage. We're like this now with Jesus. 
in, a, in that sense, but then we'll consummate the marriage and become one with Jesus soon. That's the marriage. That's, that's, that's the supper, the marriage that we're all invited to come to. But they made light of it. They made, in the Greek, they, they, were, they were careless of it. They were negligent. They didn't regard it. And they went their ways. Uh, one to his farm. One of them had a farm. He said, oh, well, I'll go over here and farm. And another to his merchandise. He was a, <coughs> a store guy or whatever. And, but in other words, they weren't paying attention. They didn't pay attention. And the remnant, that means in the remaining ones, took his servants and entreated or treated them spitefully, which means, in the Greek, it means exercise violence upon them, abuse them, used despitefully, shamefully, and slew them, and slew them. So these servants were telling the people, come to the marriage, be prepared, they're telling, and, and, uh, and the other people were abusing them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, that means he was provoked, he was enraged, he was very angry, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Now conventionally, in modern doctrine, that is an indicator that that verse there in Burned Up Their City indicates uh, the, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD under Titus. But that was a prophecy that that would happen and it did happen. But the interesting thing is things happen repeatedly in the Bible. Usually they get bigger and bigger as they, as they go further, come closer and closer to our time, okay? And I have here, and, and this burned up your city. The prophet, in other words, he destroyed them, he burned up your city where they all lived. Well, if you enlarge that a little bit, a city were to use world instead, because that's where they all live now in the world, right? We're talking now about the ultimate destruction at the end of this world. And burned up their city. Now let's look at the references it comes to the New Testament. Matthew chapter 22, verses 8 through 10. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready. But they which were bidden, that is, they were called, were not worthy. Those early people that were preached to were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. Well, that's pretty good. So now God's saying, just go out there and bring in everybody. So those servants went out onto the highways, that's what we're doing now, and gathered together all, as many as they found, both good and bad. And that's what we're doing now. Today, we have, in this congregation, we have both good and bad. Let's do this real simple. We can define that very easily. The good are the saved, born-again people, and the bad are people who are not saved and born again. That's from God's point of view. Simple that. However, you can make that transition from being not saved and not born again into being saved and born again just like that. And we'll talk about that transition. But at this point, what, what happened is here, and this is the New Testament again, then he saith unto his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways. Now we're into talking about the whole world now. And as many as ye shall find, this is an early type of the ministry of John the Baptist. This is a type and shadow of it, but I won't get involved in that. As many as you find, bid, to, bid that is called to the marriage. That's what I'm doing up here today. I'm calling you to the marriage. Those of you who are not saved, I'm calling you to the marriage. And those of you who are saved, I'm also calling you to the marriage. Very important. Both good and bad, okay? And the wedding was furnished with guests. So now we have here, there's an interesting thing we have. We have a wedding that we're all to attend, okay, uh, if we're invited and, and uh, come. And uh, good and bad. Let me just show you this. It comes to mind before I get started on. Okay. Before I get started on that, let me just show you something that kind of just came to mind here. Gideon, uh, Judges chapter 6, 7, and 8 in the Bible, is like a perfect 
rendition of the modern church and the church age, okay? It's just like perfect. And, but it's very, very symbolic. And what happened is, is the, it, it, uh, uh, the Midianites, uh, who were primarily Arab tribes, essentially Muslims, okay, before the time of Muslims, but they pre, the predated the Muslims, okay, the Midianites invaded the land of Palestine. And there were 135,000 Midianite warriors. Warriors now, who invaded the land, plus their cattle and sheep and all the other junk that came with them. And what God said to Gideon, and Gideon in the Hebrew, his name means a feller, F E L L E R. And it doesn't mean a feller like a guy, it means a, one who fells something like a tree. That's the secondary meaning, is a tree, a feller of a tree. So Gideon is represented with Jesus Christ. Because that's what Jesus Christ did as a carpenter, isn't he? So God came to Gideon and he said, assemble an army. We're going to defeat the Midianites, the 135,000 Midianites that have invaded the land. And Gideon called out the four tribes. Out of the 12, he called out the four tribes. And he amassed a total of 32,000 Israelite warriors answered the call. They responded to the call. So we can put that like this. 32,000 people came to church. Gideon called to, to, uh, to the four tribes. And out of the four tribes, there may, have been, there may have been a couple hundred thousand warriors altogether in the four tribes. 32,000 responded. Okay? They came to church. Then what God said to Gideon is, the people are too many that you have. All right? And this was like three, four, to one, four to one odds, kind of. All right? This is a hand-to-hand -hand combat. He says, you got too many people here because then if, if I give you the victory and you, and, and you defeat the Midianites, then you're going to get boastful and prideful saying you guys did it yourselves. So he, he took them to, uh, and he said, all those who are fearful and afraid, go home. He told Gideon to say that, and Gideon did. All those who are fearful and afraid, go home. In other words, all those who don't believe God for the victory, go home. So that's like me standing here telling you, all you right now today, all those of you who don't believe God is going to be victorious in, in this uh, uh, military uh, uh, quest that we have, go home. Because you don't believe God. Because God said we're going to be victorious. In fact, God said we are victorious, positionally. But if you don't believe God, then go home. And what happened is this. 22,000 of those guys looked around and said, Man, I don't see how we can defeat the Midianites. I'm going home. Now, when you don't believe God, are you saved or are you not saved? Not saved. Don't believe God? Not saved. These 22,000 people responded to the call, <clears throat> but then they didn't believe God and they went home. They retreated. They went home. That left 10,000 people, 10,000 warriors who believe God who are saved. So then the battle was 10,000 against 135,000. Now the odds are like 13, 14 to 1. Our, our hand to hand combat, impossible. Impossible. So what God said, the people are too many. Because if you give me the victory for even the 10,000, you'll say, we did it ourselves. So he tested them again. Now these are saved people he's testing now. You see. Saved people. So he tested them again and took them down to the water. And depending upon the way they drank, drank the water, uh, uh, nine, uh, 300 of them wound up 
I'll do it like this. I'm not going to get into the, because it's not my point in this. I'm going too far. But out of the 10,300 people were, were chosen warriors to go against the 135,000, and 9,700 were backup troops. They went to their tents. They didn't go home. They went to their tents. They were support troops. Okay. I wanted to give you this idea of coming, answering the call. The call is going out to all the country church today. Answer the call out of the perhaps 500,000, 2,000, 3,000 people that know that we're having church here today, you people responded to the call. Okay, so now you're in that group. But some of you are not saved. Whoa. Some of you are not in this group, you're in this group. Now let's hang in there now. Bear with me on this. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered as many as they found, both good and bad, both bad and good, both professing Christians and confessing Christians. A professing Christian is someone who says, yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, but they don't have Jesus Christ, the root of Jesus Christ in their heart. And a confessing Christian is a true believer in Jesus Christ, okay? And the wedding was furnished with guests. Now what happened? Now let's go back to the backside and see what actually happened here. Matthew chapter 22, verses 11 and 12. And when the king, and that's Father God, came in to see his guests. Now he's, a, he's got a wedding planned for his son, Jesus Christ. Okay? And here it's all set. And now the guests are all come. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. Oh, well, what's this now? Something new? He saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And a wedding garment in the Greek is apparel, especially the outer robe. The outer robe. And he saith unto him, and it is God said unto the man, Friend. Notice he said friend. He wasn't judgmental. He said friend. That's neutral. Okay. Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? How'd you come in hither? How'd you get in here without having a wedding garment on? And he was speechless. The man was speechless. Okay, now, I'm going to tell you ahead of time, the wedding garment rep uh, represents your salvation, your eternal salvation. It's the white robe of righteousness, okay? This man didn't have a wedding garment on. Now, it, it, it went in the, it, back uh, uh, several thousand years ago with the Jewish people is if you were to get married to someone, you first got engaged, you signed a contract with them, and then you parted, and the woman went back to her home, the bride-to-be, and the bridegroom-to-be went back to his home, and you parted for perhaps a year or something of that nature, a long, long time. Then when the wedding was ready, so what, what they were both doing is the woman back to, went back to her home to prepare herself to meet the bridegroom. She had to prepare herself. She had cleaned up and this, that, and educated and moved, all the things that a woman has to do to get prepared, okay? And the man went back to his home to prepare a place for the bridegroom to, for the bride to live. Because usually they live with, you know, one, a family or, or close by in any case, all right? So that was the reason for the, the, the separation. And then at the end of the separation period, the bridegroom would go to the woman's house and receive her and then take her in processional back to his, the home that he had prepared for he and his, his bride. Okay. So what we're looking at here is, and, the, and, and before that all happened, what happened now, the whole, the whole wedding is assembled. Now, let's take a big picture here. Let's say, well, let's not. Let's just let's do it like this. So you're called. And then when the king came in to see the guests, he saw the man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Why was the guy speechless? The wedding garment represents his salvation. Why was the guy speechless? Well, how do you understand the tongue of the Lord? This whole Bible is the tongue of the Lord. It's a language God has written, okay? It's the tongue of the Lord. How do you understand that? By yourself? No, you can't do that. You can't just walk up and start reading the Bible and understand what God's talking about. 
Because God put these thoughts here. You have to have the Holy Spirit inside you to interpret it for you. Right? You have to have, that's what the Holy Spirit does. He interprets the Word of God for you. He's the interpreter. This man, God came up to this man and said, friend, what are you doing here? And the guy was speechless. How come? He had no idea what God was talking about. He, could, he didn't understand God. But he was awed by God, but he didn't understand. He was just awed. Uh, he was speechless. Because he was unsaved, he didn't have the robe of righteousness on him, and he therefore did not have the Holy Spirit inside him to interpret what God said. See that? How it works? And that's what happens to people who are unsaved. This, 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 this book is just a book of nonsense. It's foolishness to them. It doesn't make any sense at all. Until you have the Holy Spirit, and then to us who had the Holy Spirit, realize, oh, now I'm beginning to understand. Because the Holy Spirit is inside you. He's explaining it to you. He's your interpreter. Okay. Now let's look at the, the first foot down here about... Uh, uh, for this is from the Living Bible. It has to do with this wedding garment, okay? It was customary for wedding guests to be given a garment to wear to the banquet. It, in other words, when you, uh, they were having a, a, a wedding banquet, there would be someone at the door. Each guest who came in would get a robe to wear, okay? They did this for cleanliness and for conformity and so forth and so on, but each guest would get a a robe to wear, and he went and sit down. So all the guests would be outward, outwardly dressed the same. It was customary for wedding guests to be given a garment to wear to the banquet. It was unthinkable to refuse to wear the, bar the garment. This would insult the host, who could only assume the guest did not want to take part in the wedding celebration. Jesus is speaking here of the garment of righteousness needed to enter God's banquet in the kingdom. That's a garment we each and every one of us has to have to get into the kingdom. We have to be able to wear it, okay? The robe is a picture of the total acceptance in God's eyes given to every believer. The robe, once you've received the robe of righteousness, that means you've been totally accepted by God. Totally accepted by God. The robe is a picture of the total acceptance in God's eyes given to every believer. It's a garment of salvation. It's a garment of salvation. It's a garment of your salvation. By Christ. Christ means the, the, the anointed or he was the Messiah. Christ has provided this garment for everyone. How did he provide this garment for them? He died to pay the penalty for all your sins. Okay? Which his, his, penalty, his payment covered your sins. But each person must choose to, Christ has provided the garment for everyone, but each person must choose to put it on in order to enter the king's banquet, which is eternal life. God has provided the robe of righteousness for everybody. That's why good and bad came to the thing. But you must choose to put it on. You're saved and born again, but you chose to become saved and born again. Perhaps at God's, at God's behest, but nevertheless, you chose to become saved and born again. You chose to put the garment of salvation on. And so now you're eligible to enter into the, the wedding feast. Now you're eligible and you can enter into the wedding feast. God, Christ has provided this garment for everyone, but each person must choose to put it on in order to enter the king's banquet hall. That's eternal life. Now, the second footnote comes from the Full Life Study Bible, also about a wedding garment. And this says, Many within the visible manifestation of the kingdom of heaven will not be wearing a wedding garment, and hence are not of the chosen. Remember, God said at the end of this prayer, or Jesus said at the end of this parable, many are called, but few are chosen.
many are called. But few are chosen. See? Many are called. Out of the, uh, there was maybe maybe there was four hundred thousand, let's say like this, warriors in those four tribes of Israel. 32,000 responded to the call of God. They came to church. But then, after God tested them, 22,000 went back home. Now, while I've been standing here preaching, we've already had a, a half a dozen people leave. As you perhaps don't know about, toward, toward the room, not half a dozen, maybe four or five anyway. Why did they leave? Not chosen. Went home. Got it? Not chosen, went home. So go to this down, the second footnote, the Full Life Study Bible. Many within the visible manifestation of the kingdom of heaven will not be wearing a wedding garment, and hence are not another chosen. The wedding garment symbolizes a condition of readiness. Oh, that's what it symbolizes. The wedding garment symbolizes a condition of readiness. Readiness for what? To be united with Christ ready to consummate the wedding as the bride to the bridegroom, ready to be the bride, have cleaned yourself up, have gotten everything straight, have, uh, and, and figuratively, as figuratively speaking, well, how would it apply to what we're doing now? Have read the, read the Bible, have done this and that, have talked about Jesus Christ, have, have witnessed to people, ready, 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 ready. Because God's calling. And he's asking, are you ready? Are you ready? These people here, they weren't ready. They weren't ready. And they went home. The wedding garment symbolizes a condition of readiness which means a present possession of true faith in Christ. These people have a present, right now, they're in possession of a true, of a true faith in Christ. Truly believe God and Jesus Christ. But not everybody does. Not everybody does. Condition of readiness represents a position, a, a, a possession of true faith in Christ and, and continued obedience made possible through the grace of Christ. Christ refers to the man, uh, I, I, wanna, I should skip that part. Let me drop down to A, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15. Talks about putting on the full armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6, you know, the full armor of God, the helmet, the breastplate of righteousness, and the helmet, and this, and the sword uh, of the Spirit, and this stuff. And, yeah. But it also says this, it says this here, it says, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That's part of being ready for the Lord. That's part of the, we don't have it here. That's part, that's part, that's part of the armor you're to put on, being ready for the Lord, okay? Okay. Along with the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet and, and the, all the other things, and and I have interjected here having and having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That's part of the deal. Now, what does that mean? Having your feet shod. Shod means put on shoes, like okay, with the gospel of peace. What does that mean? And having your feet shod with the gospel of peace. Here's what it means is this. I'm putting down the full armor of God. And incidentally, I put on the full armor of God permanently. 
I prayed that way. I don't pray every day to put on the full armor of God because I, I got it on all the time. When I sleep at night and when I wake in the day, it's always on. I prayed for it to be that way. If I put down the full armor of God and have my feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, what does that mean? What is the gospel of peace? That's this. But what is this? This is the Old Testament and the New Testament, isn't it? Oh, it's the Old Testament and the New Testament. Let me show you putting on the Old Testament. And now I put on the New Testament. And now, I'm a soldier in the army of God. I've had my feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What does preparation mean? Preparation doesn't mean I'm going to go out and attack and destroy something. It means I'm prepared as a warrior in God's army to do his bidding. I'm prepared. I'm prepared to meet Jesus Christ. I'm prepared to meet God. I'm prepared to go to heaven. I'm prepared to minister the gospel to all the universe. Are you prepared? I have my feet shod with the gospel of peace. Old Testament, New Testament. And that's what I walk in. That's what I walk in. I'm just giving you my personal thing, what I do. What you do is up to you. Do I, I always, does this, does this mean that I'm, I'm like walking on water? and I'm just, No, I still have sin in my life as well. But when I die, that sin is going to be all gone. And then I'll be a pure soldier of God. Pure. 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 Now you notice that the preparation of the gospel of peace? Okay. Let's just look here, uh, continue here. The, the, the wedding garment symbolizes the condition. Oh, I, I did, uh, oh, I'm down to that. Let's go to this footnote B, Revelation 21, verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem now. This is the end. The second to the last chapter in the Bible. This is the end. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Oh, prepared again. Prepared. Prepared again. So now what's happened is the bride has gone home and prepared herself to meet the bridegroom. And she's typified by the New Testament, New Jerusalem coming down from heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. See, I won't, I'm skipping that. Let's go down to the third footnote in, in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. The garments of salvation is the white robe of righteousness. This guy said, God said, how'd you get in here without, <laughs> without a robe? And the guy was speechless. The guy wasn't saved. Again, he wasn't saved. Many different conditions point to that. Let's go to the fourth footnote, Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. This talks about us right now, all of us, perhaps before we were saved. But we all, and even now as well, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities, in the Hebrew that means perversities, our evil, our sins, like the wind, have taken us away. Taken us away from God. Our sins. Okay. That typified exactly an unsaved guy. And it also applies to me as a saved guy because I still have sin in my life. But not as much as I used to have. Because the more I read the Bible... The more I talk to God, the less sin I have. 
filthy rags. Let's go to the fifth footnote, Revelation chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. Thou hast a few na names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. Defiled their garments. Defiled means soiled, or, or comes from the root word, which means to blacken, to dirty it up. Have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, now that's an interesting word, overcometh. It means he subdues, he prevails, he gets the victory. The same shall be clothed in white raiment. What do you got to overcome? It says here, it talks about overcomers in the Bible. Well, he overcometh, he does this, and the overcometh guy, he does this, and so He that overcometh, subdues, prevails, gets the victory, shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that overcometh, you're overcoming yourself. You're overcoming your old man, what you used to be. He's still there, old woman as the case might be. He's still there, or she. They haven't gone any place. What I used to be is still there. I've been saved for 20-some years, but what I used to be is still there. He's just not as influential on me as he used to be. In other words, I've sinned less and less and less. The longer and the closer I come to the Lord, I sin less and less and less. I'm still a sinner, but I've been forgiven. All my sins are forgiven. My past sins, my present sins. This afternoon, we're going to, everybody's going to leave here. We're going to have a fellowship meal, and then we're all going to go back home or where we're going to go, and we're going to start sinning again. In fact, we're probably sinning even before we even get out of here, okay? Because we're just part of us. But you know you're, you're accomplishing something when you realize and look back in your own history and realize you're not doing the same things that you used to do before you know, become to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You're being changed, and you didn't do it. God did it. Amen. But you had to take God in. You had to read Philippians to know that God is the guy who does the work. Okay? You had to read this, this book. You to take us in, and that's, that's the power that's inside you that's changing you from day to day to day to day. You know, I've never met anyone who said to me, well, I've never met anyone who said to me, I wish I'd never been born again. I never heard that in my entire life. But if you, if you, if you analyze and talk to people who are saved and born again, the difference between being saved, born again, and unsaved is this. And I'll talk to you in two words. Misery. Which is unhappiness and that's when I change. And I had everything. I had wine, women, and song. I had the whole, I mean, all, all you can I had an abundance of all the things that the world says you're supposed to have. And I still wasn't happy. I was satisfied, you know, temporarily, but I was never happy. And now I don't have, I have very little of those things that the world says we're supposed to have. And I'm a happy guy. I am happy. Isn't that the most important thing to get? I mean, I was wealthy, moderately wealthy. I mean, I had a lot of money. I went from being nothing to somebody. I was a big shot in different towns and countries around, not countries, but towns. I did a lot of things and have been involved in a lot. Didn't mean nothing. But when I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior, that's when that started happening. I started to get happier and happier and happier. And now, I have very little. I mean, comparatively speaking, like I used to have. But God's provided for me. Everything. And that's what he says. He says, cast your cares upon me, for I care for you. Or for, he, he cares for you. He cares about you. Because you, I've become a child of God. And you who have become children of God, God cares about you too. 
Why does God care about you? For one thing, he can identify you because you're all, every one of you who's saved in the morning again, is wearing a white robe of righteousness. When God looks at you, that's what he sees. Man, isn't that something? And we, we who are saved in the morning again are going to enjoy the fellowship and the consummation as a bride with the bridegroom Jesus Christ at the Supper of the Lamb. That's waiting for us. And incidentally, right immediately as that ends, the millennial, in fact, that is part, that is, I think that's the beginning of the millennial kingdom. At the conclusion or during the, the marriage supper of the Lamb begins the millennial kingdom of a thousand year reign of Jesus Christ on this earth. Because he'll reign through us. Revelations, the sixth footnote, Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 through 9. Let us be glad and rejoice. Well, oh, that's true. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Ready means prepared in the Greek. His wife hath made herself ready. Praise God. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in white, in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he said unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Blessed, every person here who's wearing a white robe of righteousness is going to have great joy in the marriage supper of the Lamb. You are blessed. You are blessed, you are blessed, you are blessed. However, how about that guy who didn't have the robe on? What happened to him? Matthew chapter 22, verses 13 and 14. Then said the king to his servants, that's us now, bind him hand and foot, and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. This is the guy who is speechless. Bind him hand and foot. That's so he can't, the hand is work and your foot is your walk. Bind him hand and foot so he can't walk in the kingdom, he can't work in the kingdom, okay? And cast him into outer darkness. There should be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let me describe outer darkness to you in the terms that I believe is what it is. Space, of course, you look out into the universe and you see the spaces, you see the, the stars, okay, and the sun. But you, at night you, you see the stars, but there's the black in between. That's, that's space, okay? That's the void. That's where you'll be cast into the void. You'll be cast alone. Bound hand and foot, can't move, all right? And no one will ever talk to you again. It's called ultimate solitary confinement. You can't see anything, you can't feel anything, and no one will ever talk to you again. No word at all from anyone, forever and ever and ever. Now that is not the type of, type of existence that I would prefer. You know why he did that? He cast him into outer darkness? Because this man who was speechless was a weed. W-E-E-D. You know, there's wheat and there's weeds. And what do you do with the weeds? You take the weed into God's garner. Tares, okay? It's looking like this, if you will. You take the, the weed, into, the wheat that's us, the good stuff, into God's barn. And you cast the terrors, the weeds, the useless things, speechless, into outer darkness. And everybody here is right on the premises of that. If you're not saved and born again, you're just standing in a very dangerous spot. 
Because at any second, the Lord Jesus Christ could return, or at any second, you could die. You could have a heart attack, you could have a meteor come down, you could have an explosion, you know, all kinds of things could happen to you. Dead. Done. Once you're dead, you're done. That's it. The Bible tells us we don't even pray for the dead. How come? Because God has already made his decision about that. Once you're dead, you're done. And how would you like to spend all eternity in nothingness with no touch, even a touch on your shoulder, an arm, or a, a, a mention of hi, how are you, or nothing, just all eternity, being alone, in darkness, seeing nothing. That's the very opposite of God's love. But what you're seeing here, that's how extreme it is. Take God's love, his immense, enormous, unfathomable love, and take the opposite of that is the guy walking, not walking, but the guy floating in eternal darkness, or girl is floating in eternal darkness. You ought to be scared. I would be. The footnote, first footnote here, Nelson Study Bible. Mind him hand and foot is a vivid picture of the man's inability, that was a speechless guy, the man's inability to participate in, in Christ's kingdom. How can, if you look at it like this, how can a saved guy, how can an unsaved guy go to heaven? It will be to torture for him. Sure torture, because everything is God, everything is good, everything is love. That's just the opposite of what this guy is. is a vivid picture of the man's inability to participate in God's in Christ's kingdom. Someone claiming to be to belong at the wedding while refusing to wear the correct garment was similar to the Israelites who claimed to be God's people while refusing to obey him. <laughs> I talked to you about the tithes. The Lord says and that, that, that's a, a sacrament to me. The Lord says, tithes, obey me. He says, I'll reward you. I'll, I'll open the windows of heaven above you. And still you don't, you don't, he didn't give you a reward. I and mean, you still don't tithe. You don't obey God. Well, you ain't going to get a second chance. Obey him now or never. Everything could end. Now, Eventually, the, uh, we're going to have a, a nuclear warfare, and they're going to they're, first one of the first things they're going to hit is this command post over in uh, in Tampa, uh, uh, in the air base there. Well, that's going to affect us, of course. We're going to be we're going to be gone. We don't have to worry about what we're going to do after nuclear warfare hits. We're uh, 12 miles away from it or so, so we're going to be out of out of it. Actually, about 15 miles. And we're going to go anyway. Even if you live through it, where are you going to go? We're in Florida. We're on the coast. Anyway, we're getting involved in that. The Israelites who claimed to be God's people while refusing, refusing to obey. This man was an imposter, and when he was discovered, as all imposters will be, he was cast into outer darkness, referring to the, the judgment. The full life study of the second footnote. The full life study Bible. Fewer chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. Few are chosen. The call to salvation goes out to many. The call to salvation goes out to many. Let's say 400,000 warriors of the four tribes. But only 32,000 responded. And then of the 32,000, only 10,000 of them actually believed God. The call to salvation goes out to many. However, the few who are chosen to inherit the kingdom of heaven are only those who respond to God's call, number one. Number two, repent of their sins. And three, believe in Christ. That's how it works. First, you respond. Everybody here today responded to God's call. You're here. Now, to be saved and born again, you must either have repented of your sins or are willing to repent of your sins, and you must believe in Christ. Believe in Jesus, 
believe God where these guys here didn't do it. These guys will be burning in the, in, in the lake of fire. They'll be cast into outer darkness. Responding to, to God's grace by the free exercise of our will brings us into the chosen people of God. Now, why did I have, why, why did God put it on me to give this message for you today? Because it's about here, guys. Boy, you can see that. I mean, anybody can see that. We've about had it. This whole country's about had it. And when this country's had it, the whole world's had it. Things are going to happen real, real, real fast from here on in. And they're happening real fast from here on in. I believe the Lord Jesus Christ is soon to return to take us out of this mess when it gets really, really bad, which is a lot worse than it is now, but that might only be in a week. Or, <laughs> you know, you can't tell anymore about these things. Look at Turkey over there has now uh, got a, a rebellion going on. It's, it's, it's going to happen all over the world. And then all the, the nuclear bombs are going to start floating around, and I believe that's the, the coming of Jesus Christ at the same time. Praise God. Jesus Christ said in John 3, 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. See means understand. Well, the fellow he was talking to is a guy named Nicodemus, and Nicodemus didn't understand. <laughs> he was an authority in the Bible, and he didn't understand. So, the Apostle Paul in, in Romans 10, 9, explained how, it, it, how you become saved and born again. He said, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, say words out loud, a prayer of the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart, and believe in thine heart, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised, hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. In other words, you'll be part of this group. So I asked today, I have a little prayer that I say. And if there's anyone here today who would like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to say this little prayer, and you can say it with me and receive and become, become a child of God. Be, be no more speechless, but God will give you the, give, how will I say, put it in you to speak, to understand, to understand God, Him. But you can't understand God unless you received Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, into your heart. So this is how you do it. You say some words out loud. A little prayer. Asking God to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you and bless you with more of Him. Anybody here like to say this with me today? I'll say this. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Anyone else? Anybody else like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today? Back there? Yes, sir. Come on forward a little bit so I can see you. Good. Anybody else? Like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Anthony, are you, have you done it? Are you? Will you come up? Come up, please. I was going to. I'm not going to do this. But you see, I preached to, to guys and had had the same guy raise his hand maybe 200 or 300 times over the course of a few years. Thank you, dear. God bless you. Come up here. All right. Anybody else? Join us. And, you know, they'd say the prayer. There's 200, 200, 200 times, and they'd say the prayer every time. But, you know, one time it took. It only takes one time. The last time they said it, it took. See? So. Now, we have an Internet congregation. If any of you folks in the Internet congregation would like to say this prayer, please... Stand where you're at and repeat after me this prayer. And, yes, I, uh, uh, no, that's all right, that's all right. Anybody here would like to say, I'm going to say the prayer for these three folks, okay? And anybody who would like to say this with me, please, and be like an, like an angel escorting them to the, to the heavenly door, 
Please stand with me and say it with me as well, okay? Your name is? Joseph. Joseph, do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid the penalty for your sins and was resurrected? Your name is? Tony. Tony, do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid the penalty for your sins and was resurrected? Yes. And your name is? Cassandra. Cassandra? Cassandra. Cassandra. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid the penalty for your sins and was resurrected? Yes, sir. Good. Okay, girls, let her get the girl, her kid in the middle. Okay, we're all going to say this prayer. Father God, Father God I, confess I'm a sinner. I confess I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I believe, I believe that, Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ died on the cross, died on the cross and paid the penalty, paid the penalty for, all for all my sins and was resurrected. Thank you, Lord. Father God, Father God, please send your son, send your, son your, seed, your seed, your love, your, love, your, fire, your fire, into my heart, into my heart to, be Lord, to be the Lord and Savior, and Savior of, my life. of my life. Thank you, Father God. You, Father God. Amen. 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 God bless God. All right, let me wait. Let me, don't go away. <laughs> give, me, give, me a hug. give me a hug, partner. Come on. Let's God bless you guys all. God bless you. All right. Uh, Shara, can you get your names for me, please? I got it. Oh, got it? Okay. Please have a seat. All right, don't go any place yet. We're going we're gonna to do something else. The dancing girls are coming in, so we got to... No. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, I know what we want to do. I forgot. Come on. Okay, we're going to take tithes and offerings now, okay? And we do this at the end of every, every uh, uh, message. If you don't tithe, it doesn't mean you're not going to go to heaven. God's not going to kick you out of heaven because you don't tithe. That's like sinning. You make a sin, and you say, oh, I can't go to heaven now. I swore I did something. No, God's not going to kick you out of heaven. You're boys and girls. God, I mean, how many children do you know who are perfect? I mean, you got kids, I never did any kids that were perfect, did you? God knows you're not perfect. He knows you're still going to make mistakes. He knows you're going to still sin. But you need to think about what God said in Malachi about tithing. He said, return to me. Return means the assumption is he's given you everything that you have. He says, return to me, and I will open the windows of heaven above you so that you cannot receive all the blessings that are going to flow down upon you. And they'll fall off of you onto other people. That's what he said. And then he said this. He said, try me. He said, test me. Try in the King James, but he said, that means test. He said, it's the only place in the Bible God ever said, test me. You don't ever want to test God. Like, you know, oh, there's a truck coming. I'll walk out in front of that. I'm saved and God will save me. Bang, you're gone. All right? You don't ever want to test God except for this one time. He said, try me. He said, tithe and see what happens to your life. He said, tithe and see what happens to your life. How come? Because it's going to change. You know how come? Because I'm going to bless you. Is your life is going to be blessed. What kind of a life are you living now? Could it be better? <laughs> and this is also a symbol of your uh, or a self-test. Because you know your heart. God knows your heart. But he wants you to know your heart. Are you going to be obedient to him? Because that's what God wants. That's the purpose of this obedience. What you're, what you're doing is by tithing, you're casting your cares upon God. All right? He's going to take care of you. So you made $10 this week. A dollar of it, 10% goes to God. All right? He's going to take care of you. He said he's going to take care of you. Let him take care of you. Praise God. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for blessing us and saving us and loving us. And Ah, Lord. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for, oh, thank you for saving us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for saving us. We so look forward to being with you. Oh, praise God. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. God's coming soon. One more thing before we go. We're going to have a... a you, stand and pray about the food we're about to partake of.
Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. We thank you for protecting us, uh, coming and going, dear Lord. To go out and share this meal together, we ask you to put blood in there, Father. Let's edify each other and glorify you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. All right. Fellowship meal in the other warehouse. We're ready.